Hi, my name is Lee Rayford. I am pleased to be presenting today as part of the Global Photography Symposium. The work I'm presenting here is part of a book I'm completing entitled When Home is a Photograph, Blackness and Belonging in the World. This book is about how black people use photography to make home in the world. I focus on a handful of well-known black American activists and artists who travel the world for study, for work, or for movement building, sometimes for pleasure and sometimes because their lives and the lives of their loved ones depended on it. Like many of us, their personal sense of self and their political platforms were elaborated through these encounters with the world. And like most of us, they made and collected photographs at every stage. When Home is a Photograph considers the everyday image making practices that this group of Black Americans, each committed to improving the conditions of Black lives globally, have engaged to imagine, identify, create, fabulate, inhabit, leave, defend, and sometimes destroy home. This project attends to the ways Black artists and activists engage photography as a mode of emplacing themselves in an anti-Black world. Such emplacement through photography is not simply or solely about a, a comforting self-image over and against the imposition of colonial uses of photography as a site of violence, but it's instead about the ways photography serves a pedagogical tool for learning oneself. I argue that the photograph is a site where the terms of belonging can be worked out, where values can be iterated and practiced, whether of the Black collective asserting home in the world, Black kin longing for home in each other, or the Black individual seeking home in, in one's skin. So when is home a photograph? And how can a photograph become a home? Home, of course, can, of course, can variously reference a physical location, a material possession, uh, or an imagined geography. It can be a site of shelter and comfort where we are encouraged to be our best and truest selves. And home can also be a place of violence and uncertainty, the origins of our most enduring traumas. For Black folks in the United States, from those brought forcibly in 1619 to those arriving full of hope next week, there is no place, there really is no place, no time in this country's history that we have allowed to be, uh, we've been allowed to be settled, to be free, to be safe, to claim home. It is no wonder that home has emerged as an elusive object of desire for the natally alienated. Thus to our concept of home, we might also add a distinct temporality outside of the flow time regulated by racial capitalism. To the long list of what encompasses the event of photography, that is the technological equipment, the people who wield the equipment to make photographs, the modes of distribution, circulation, and consumption of photographs, the relationships generated by photographs, the constantly expanding set of audiences, spectators, and witnesses, and of course the photograph itself. To this long list, we might also add physical location and an imagined geography. For my purposes here, the places from where I want to consider the places from where black folks make photography, the place for where places where photography takes us and what photography can take tell us about the black, the place of blackness. In the book, I devote chapters to portrait photography made by James Van Der Zee of Marcus Garvey and the Universal Negro Improvement Association in the 1920s um, to the ethnographic family and travel photography of Southern Africa. Um, made by author, activist, and anthropologist Islanda Good Robeson in the 1930s and 40s, and to the landscape photography of James Van Der Zee and of Dawood Bay, made more than a century apart. The third chapter of the book closely examines a family photo photography album made by Black Panther Party communications secretary and longtime activist Kathleen Neal Cleaver. Um, the album is of her family's time living in exile in Algeria and France from 1969 to 1972. Um, it's a mix of amateur snapshots, professionally made images, commissioned government portraits um, that, in, that Kathleen gathered, um, archived, and moved with her, with her across years and geographies, um, and put together into a, curated by Cleaver, into a, into a nondescript mass-produced album um, to tell the quotidian story of a family living under the most e extraordinary circumstances. The Algiers album is one particularly rich artifact in Cleaver's personal photography collection. Um, and the chapter draws on my three years of working with Cleaver in her home, leading a team, 
uh, organizing and cataloging this archive, um, which was a, uh, acquired by Emory University's Rose Library in the spring of uh, 2020. While this photography collection broadly and the family album specifically have great political and historical significance, um, you know, enriching our knowledge about the Black Panther Party, the work of Black internationalism in the era of Black power, and gender politics in the context of Black revolutionary struggles, it's perhaps best understood as a family archive. Thus, I read the Algiers album as a Black woman authored text that offers an affective and personal history of a movement that has conv been conveyed primarily as historical document. Its form as a family album forces us to reckon with the messiness of movement and cannot deny um, cannot deny the failures and disappointments of family relations, whether a difficult marriage, a growing community of exiles, family as a metaphor for nationalism, or as a map of intergenerational kinship ties. So let me use the remainder of my time to talk about two photographs of Kathleen Neal Cleaver at home. One is famous while the other is faded and largely forgotten. Uh, both are true. The first photograph um, you see in which um, Kathleen wields a heavy gauge pump shotgun as she stands guard at the entrance to the San Francisco apartment she shared with her husband, Minister of Information, Black Panther Minister of Information, Eldridge Cleaver. It initially appeared, the photograph initially appeared as part of an alternative press news article um, and Kathleen, in her role as Black Panther Party Communications Secretary, had this image transformed into a political campaign poster. It's an iconic image meant to offer a message of inspiration to Panther rank and file membership and issue a warning to Panther detractors and self-declared enemies. It does so both in its moment and across time. It is unapologetic and polemic. It's sensational, sexy, resistant highly re reproduced, widely circulated, circulated, and occasionally imitated. It is at once fierce and fearsome, but also funny, by which I mean so iconic as to have occluded some of its iconoclasm. Yet in all my years of looking at this image, I never gave a lot of thought to what lay through the black portal of the door or what exactly, materially, not just abstractly, Kathleen was protecting so fiercely. The second photograph um, was made a year later. Um, the second photograph was made a year later and 6,000 miles away in Algiers. And it's affixed to a page of the family album where, um, where beneath the photograph, Kathleen has written Point Piscot um, or Piscot in November 1969. Kathleen is seated in a black chair, dressed casually, holding reading material with one hand and a beverage in the other. Her gaze is averted from the camera and her attention is instead focused on the book in her lap. A towel is wrapped around her head, suggesting she's just washed her hair, tending to the afro that was so central to her public image. Yet here in this intimate photograph, the afro, a source of pride, a marker of militancy, is unseen, protected and it's Kathleen's alone. This photograph is as quiet as the first is loud. Quiet in the way scholar Kevin Quashi invokes that word, not silent or silenced, but inward facing, selfful, suggesting surrender. This photograph is intimate and meditative. It is full of breath and air and a stillness that is not immobile, a calm that suggests the capacity to receive. Like the towel wrapped carefully around her hair, the photograph outlines Kathleen's interiority, acknowledging its presence while withholding its substance. Perhaps above all, this is an image of an icon of the black radical tradition at rest. Whatever Kathleen is protecting so fiercely in this photograph is hers and hers alone. Photographs I would come to learn through my work organizing her personal photography archive are central to Kathleen's self-making and sense of belonging. For Kathleen, the keeper um, of her family's archives, spanning more than um, spanning, spanning more than uh, a century and a half, 
and, and a collector of photographs of herself across the many geographies of her life. Photographs function as a tool to situate herself within place and time and within her, within her own narrative. Though the organizing work of our team was generally confined to Kathleen's upstairs office, photographs, more than any other visual medium, decorate and warm every room. There is no space in her home from which one cannot see or touch a framed photograph. Kathleen's relation to and practice of photography was a reminder to me of Deborah Willis's evergreen assertion that photographs of all kinds, regardless of genre, are central to Black storytelling, and it underscored Bell Hooks's insight that interior home walls of photographs, quote, announced our visual complexity. First approached as opposites, I soon came to recognize the two photographs, um, the two images of Kathleen at home as mutually informative. The Pine Street poster alerts us to photography's role in amplifying public performances of Black resistance, while the Point Piscot snapshot offers an image of the sovereignty of quiet, to borrow Kevin, from Kevin Quashi again, the domain of self beyond the demands of an external gaze. But more than counterweights, what might these photographs reveal about the other? How might these photographs enable us to witness the depth of Kathleen's living? Image events not as counter to one another, nor as consecutive or causal, that is protest, then rest, then protest again, as if there is a linear, linear singularity to Black life. Rather, viewed together in this manner, they indicate a fullness to living that photography promises but can never deliver. Finally, working to grasp these two photographs of Kathleen at home in their breath and abundance sadly alerted me to the limits of my own sight, which is also a way of saying the limits of my ability to imagine Black belonging in the world. And yet it was allowing myself the patience to wonder about the unseen in these images beyond the apartment door, under the head wrap, that began to suggest another way of engaging photography. Tina Camp diverse that beyond looking at images, to listen to images is, quote, to perceive their quiet frequencies of possibility, the possibility to inhabit a future as unbounded Black subjects, end quote. Following Camp and Cleaver and all of us who seek a home in photography, I ask, what do we have to unlodge or unlearn or undo in order to reimagine photography's relationship? to black life. Thank you.